spoiled brat loses his finger because his Karen mum lets him run wild at my workplace. I worked for a research facility which funds clinics handling patients for our area of expertise. To celebrate our first completely funded sites, we decided to create free t-shirts to commemorate our success. I was asked to design the tees and have them printed and produced for our next conference. I secured a local printer to produce the shirts, and when they were completed, I went to the printers to pick them up. When I got there and produced my invoice, they needed to prepare and wrap them, which would take a few minutes, and said I could wait in the lobby. While waiting, a woman and her son, around five, came in for her order for a family reunion. She barely paid attention to the staff, and when told to wait, she got on her phone, pretty much ignoring her son, who was running all around the lobby, screaming at the top of his lungs. He then decided to run behind the counter towards the back where the printing machines were. The counter clerk tried to get the woman's attention, but she just ignored the clerk and continued talking on her phone. The counter clerk did successfully get the kid to go back into the lobby, but she was called to the back to pick up my package. The kid saw this as his chance to shoot behind the counter and went running into the back. I thought one of the staff would catch him, but they were swamped with orders and just didn't see him run past. By the time someone spotted him, It was too late. There was a loud, high-pitched scream and crying, and then there was a loud commotion, and it appeared everyone was screaming, except the mother who was still on her phone, oblivious to the chaos coming from the back. That's when another staff member came out carrying the crying kid and holding a bloody towel around his hand, and screaming to the receptionist to call 911. Only then did Karen turn around to see her son, and then screamed at the staff member, What did you do to my son? The staff member stated that somehow the kid got to the back, ran up to one of the working machines, and stuck his hand between the hot blades and it sliced off one of his fingers. The entitled parents started screaming at the staff member and counter clerk, berating them and threatening to sue them, while still ignoring her son in the staff member's arms, who was trying to stop the bleeding. That was when I, a nurse, came up and assessed the situation and got something to slow down the bleeding and try to save the mostly severed finger. As the ambulance pulled up, the lady was still on the phone telling whomever she was talking to what had happened to her son, and she still hadn't checked on or even touched her son. The staff member transferred the boy to the EMTs and they put him in the ambulance and took him to the hospital. This absolute moron of a lady actually waited and demanded her package before she even attempted to follow the ambulance to the hospital. A month later, when I went back to the printers for another order of teas, I had to ask if they ever heard what happened to the little boy. He did lose his finger, and the entitled mother was charged with the neglect due to testimony by the staff of the shop. Didn't find out much more than that, but I do hope the entitled parent didn't regain custody of that poor kid. I just wanted to thank everyone who gave me an award and for all the upgrades. I'd like to add that this happened in the late 1980s. I told my daughter that I posted this, and she reminded me that she was with me at the printers when it happened. She was mortified by the Karen's behavior. I am now 73 years old, and it's still just so visual in my mind. As for why they didn't use my testimony, that was because they had video evidence that the staff weren't even aware that there was a kid in the shop, let alone that he was running around. The counter clerk didn't even tell the workers out back as he had the wild and outlandish notion that the entitled parent wouldn't let her kid run into a busy industrial zone with heavy machinery. It showed that the parent wasn't paying attention to her son and he got back there and it happened so fast that nobody had time to react to him. Look, all parents have their moments when their notice slips and their kids fall down the stairs or decide to take flying leaps off the roof into the pool or go and try to pet that nice friendly looking but rabid German shepherd. At that age, we placehold our interest in relationships with a burning curiosity for the most dangerous looking thing in our eyesight. The best parents can look away for half a second and the little brainiacs will likely find the most efficient route from their child-safe playpen to the emergency room. But this kid's injury is entirely on her. That, coupled with her negligence at a time when the boy definitely needed the reassurance and help that only a parent can provide, clearly make her the jerk here. The part that well and truly clinched her just being an awful parent to me was relaying the events on her phone to a friend rather than being there for her kid. I think it's a no-brainer to all of us that if any member of your family loses a part of their body, the priority is getting them the help they need and then comforting them. Bonus jerk points for sticking around to pick up her package. 
Her reaction sounds more akin to irritation that her property was damaged than the absolute blind panic of realizing your kid is injured. I hope that kid got a better caretaker later. Submit your own stories to be featured here on the channel, linked in the description below. And if you want to listen to some very good music in the background while you're chilling, check out easymode.com, also linked below, and subscribe. From a manager, I used suggestions from the internet to change my company. I'm a senior manager at a small firm, under 30 staff. During the pandemic, our revenue skyrocketed as we were all able to work from home in a high-demand industry. My boss, the business owner, asked for my input in how we reward the team. He was thinking a team activity or a Christmas bonus. Reading different people's stories about their work-life balances has made me question why we spend so much of our life working just to get by. So I put together a proposal. Let's work less and give everyone more space in their personal life. My proposal was the following. To provide a permanent pay increase of 10% to all staff. Give an extra five days off per year. I come from a country where four weeks is standard, so this increased to five weeks total. And make Monday an optional work day. Finish all your work from last week? Great, don't come in. The week officially begins on Tuesday and that's when we meet together. Feeling a little behind? Your Monday is for you to catch up from home, and you don't have to meet or work with anyone else. The proposal was accepted four months ago and all I can say is, wow. What a difference it's made to the team happiness with no decline in revenue. The story is a far cry to some of the anti-work stuff that I normally see on the internet, but I did want to share it, as without reading people's posts, I wouldn't have thought to suggest such a thing to my bosses. This is the correct way to do office work, goal-based and not attendance-based. The narrator is a big fan of doing the occasional couple of mega days and getting a three-day weekend from time to time, and it can be great to have the extra flexibility if your workplace supports this. Honestly, I'm just stunned that an upper-level manager approved this as much as anything. Those of us who work freelance are capable of shuffling our schedules around and reallocating work that we have. I'm not sure I've ever heard of it being approved in an office environment outside of Europe. Obviously, this is of little comfort to our comrades in retail and hospitality. Your hard work is appreciated. So I wore the wrong type of underwear in the pool. I, a 24-year-old male, hosted a friend from college, also 24 male, that I haven't seen since before the pandemic. Shortly after he arrives, we head to a local bar and grill in our neighborhood. We decided to do the 15-20 to 20 minute walk instead of driving so we didn't have to worry about leaving the car. I was joined by my roommate, 25 male and also a good friend, and his newish girlfriend, 22, who I don't know that well but who I always have friendly encounters with when we hang out. At the bar, drinks flowed freely and my friends seemed to really hit it off with our crew. We stayed longer than expected and it was fully dark and we were all buzzed by the time we decided to walk home. It was still hot outside when we got to the apartment complex, so my roommate suggested that we hit the community pool. The pool and hot tub were technically closed for the night, but it isn't too close to any of the units and generally no one cares if you're responsible and don't break glass bottles or anything like that. After debating whether to head back to our place to change first, my roommate insisted that we're all friends here, and that we could all just go to the pool in our underwear. Everyone agreed on this, although my roommate's girlfriend announced, you guys have fun with that, and proceeded to lounge next to the pool on one of the deck chairs and scroll Instagram. We strip down and hop in the pool and are having a pretty good time just messing around. After some time had passed, my roommate was chatting with his girlfriend and then quietly approached me afterwards. Apparently, his girlfriend was very uncomfortable with me wearing just briefs in the pool. Both my roommate and my friend were wearing boxer briefs, and she wanted me to go all the way back to the apartment and change into a swimsuit. I initially protested and said it was his idea in the first place, and how everyone was in their underwear, and none of us cared, and asked what the difference was. It's not like my underwear was white or see-through or anything like that. My roommate asked me to go and change for him as a favor so that it didn't turn into an issue between him and her. I was teed off, but I decided to let it go for the time being. When I got back to the apartment, an idea popped into my head when it occurred to me that I still had a swimsuit from when I used to swim on the club team in college. So I put on my Speedo and head back out armed with another six-pack for the boys in only a t-shirt, towel wrapped around my waist, and flip-flops. I get back to the pool, announced that I'd changed into my swimsuit, as requested, drop the towel and ditch the tee, and launch into a wicked cannonball into the pool. 
I can see a wry smile on my roommate's face, but nothing else was said about my choice of attire. We go on in the pool, and a few minutes later she announces that she's tired and is going to bed. We stay out late, including a few more beers, and laugh in the hot tub while the girlfriend was asleep at our place. Debatably the jerk, since you went out of your way to make someone uncomfortable, but from my biased point of view it shouldn't have been a problem to begin with. It's rare to see this level of malicious compliance outside the workplace, and it is glorious. Also, you guys are a lot more prudish than the narrator and his friends. Don't have your togs? No problem. Nobody here is so sheltered that they haven't seen an au naturel person a few times in their lives, right? All adults present agree that it will be blurred by the water? Birthday suit cannonball away! But look, even if you're not a weirdo like us, can we accept that it's illogical to presumably be fine with a bikini and yet not okay with speedos or a speedo-like underwear in this case? Perhaps offer to put on a bikini top if it's got the extra level of coverage required to make it okay in her eyes. Anyway, rant over. In my opinion, not the jerk in this particular case, but factor in a hefty amount of weird narrator bias. If you like Am I the Jerk, you're probably going to love Am I the Genius. Check it out, linked below. And if you want to listen to some very good music, check out easymode.com. Also linked below and subscribe. Am I the Jerk for only paying for myself when my fiancé and future in-laws invited me to a New Year's Eve dinner at a scale restaurant? I, female, 32, just got engaged to my fiancé, male, 37, Sam. We do not live together because we're waiting till marriage, given he and his family are highly conservative Christians, but they're really nice and lovable people. I had plans to spend New Year's Eve with Sam, but he said he was out for New Year's Eve dinner celebrations with his parents, then called me again inviting me to join them, and I happily did. His parents were there. They welcomed me and ordered many dishes and desserts and drinks. We celebrated and had a great time, that is, until it was time to pay. I pulled my wallet out of my bag, letting them know that we'll split the check between us. Sam mumbled, No, you, you don't have to, we invited you. But I insisted. He and his parents then stared at me. I asked what was wrong, and both mother-in-law and father-in-law said they didn't have money on them. I was shocked. I turned to Sam and he said he too forgot his wallet at home, and didn't bring enough money to cover even a round of drinks. His dad then laughed nervously, Alright, so I guess we should let the doctor pay. I was taken aback. I said, I'm sorry, but no, this is just too much money to spend on one dinner by myself, and I didn't think I was expected to pay the entire bill. Sam said I should pay, and he'd pay me back later, but I said no, since I know he will have to get a job to pay that much money. I said, I'm sorry, but this isn't the first time I've been put in this situation by him and his family, where I'm expected to rescue them after they somehow forgot their wallets, and expect others to pay hundreds for their extravagant dinner. I told them I'll only pay for what I had and that's it. He and his parents were shocked. They started arguing about how I have the potential to pay right there and then, but I was acting as if they were strangers, not family. But that doesn't mean I'm obligated to pay. How could someone go out to a fancy restaurant, order so many dishes, desserts and drinks without bringing money? Sam begged that I just do it and call it a night, but I refused. The argument got heated and then I got up and walked out. Sam called later at 2am basically yelling that I ruined New Year's Eve celebrations and made his parents suffer, because I refused to pay the entire bill and instead acted selfishly and paid only for myself after they were gracious enough to invite me. I told him how unfair it was for me to pay even if I have a good salary it doesn't mean that I want to spend it all on fancy dinners for them. He didn't reply, he just said he'll pray that my parents will let this go and not resent me after I basically damaged the relationship with them. I felt awful thinking I should have covered the bill instead of leaving. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Who goes out to a family dinner on a special occasion and just forgets the means to pay for it? Presumably, father and mother-in-law had a joint account and one of them could pay, even in the off chance that one of them forgot their wallet, right? I don't know if this makes me a paranoid person, but this honestly sounds like they planned this. Three people don't all forget their wallets when going out. What, did they drive there without their licenses or the means to pay for parking or pay for the taxi? I don't think so. They invited you to something that at least the parents had fully planned to lump you with the bill for from the beginning, and then on making it just awkward enough that you would pay up and never bring it up again. Good on you for sticking up for yourself. I probably would have paid and just quietly resented them for the remainder of the relationship or until they'd taken advantage a few more times and then had a real public meltdown. 
And let's face it, they were definitely going to keep doing this if you didn't stand up for yourself. I couldn't find any more info on whether you and your fiancé stayed together after this, but either way, you did the right thing. Manipulate my doctor's note? Okay, here's a new one. I work at a distribution center, and unfortunately, I injured my knee while working one night. We're not sure what happened, the case is currently ongoing. In the beginning, they were pretty accommodating until they noticed a loophole in my worker's comp doctor's note based on how it was written. And this part is important. The note stated to give me two to three 15 minutes break to rest and ice. The doctor meant this to be included with our regular two lunches. The operations manager and HR decided that two of those breaks were covered by one of the lunches and would only give me one additional 15 minute break. I objected, stating he very well knew what the doctor intended, but he didn't budge. Fine. I go back to the doctor and mention what happened. Naturally, he was annoyed and wrote a new one stating to give me a 15-minute break every two hours. Easy, right? No. The operations manager and HR consolidated my lunches for the breaks because of how it's written. Once again, I go back to the doctor. Now, he's teed off and includes a, in addition to regular lunches, on the note because they're so focused on how it's written. Operations manager is furious when I show the note and said he refuses to pay me for those breaks, to which I'm pretty sure is illegal, right? I submit a letter of concern to the safety supervisor along with a statement that I'm planning on bringing this to a higher power, a carefully chosen word for lawyer. Then I spoke with the head of HR. Like magic, the operations manager presented me with a reasonable break schedule and has me assigned to a department where I'd be stationary. Bonus! Not everyone is a pushover who won't fight back. In short, got hurt at work, the job exploited my doctor's note twice, I used their own words against them, they got mad, I threatened to sue, and the matter was resolved. Sadly, I'm still getting treated, but at least I can rest a little easier now. This nonsense was messing with me at home. I appreciate your guys' time. Holy crap, this blew up. After reading a lot of comments suggesting to push things further, I'm definitely going to look into it. I did log everything with dates and details, as well as kept a copy of the letter I submitted. Thank you everyone for your support. And no, it's not Amazon. I failed to mention the operations manager tried to throw my second job in my face when I confronted him. One, that's irrelevant to the current matter. Two, are you kidding? The second job I don't really do anything other than sell games. You can figure it out. And they let me sit if I need to, without issue. And as a late update, unfortunately I was terminated for having a speaker at my desk. In a department where everyone else has a speaker as well. Ironically, this happened not long after I submitted a complaint to OSHA as some of you had suggested. Not related because the people who fired me didn't know, but pretty obvious on the intent. Sorry for the sour news guys, and believe me, this fight is far from over. Well, all we can say is well done for continuing that good fight for as long as you did there. Not everyone would have kept up the heroic resistance and hopefully they were a little more careful about how they treated these cases going forward and other people got an easier deal than you did when working out their injuries. The absolute disregard most distribution centers display towards the physical needs of their employees in America is an absolute travesty in general. And to be honest, it sounds like yours isn't even the worst one of the batch. I'm sure the headache you gave them and your eventual firing on highly circumstantial evidence weren't unrelated. I couldn't find any more updates after your firing, but I hope, if nothing else, that you gave them one heck of a headache for a while. It goes without saying that in 95% of cases, these mega companies are the jerk. The fact that they often fold as soon as people threaten to get legal help shows that they know that what they're doing is wrong too. I don't know how the people in charge live with themselves. The narrator has had his fair share of somewhat exploitative bosses when working in fast food and hospitality. It's amazing how poorly people will treat you right up until you show them you're prepared to fight. At one of my first jobs in high school, my summer gig at a fried chicken store in a local mall treated me like absolute crap. Long hours, last-minute schedule changes, an overbearing boss who would yell at me if I couldn't come in. When I told them that I couldn't keep working 12-hour days, 5 days a week, they told me not to come back in. Now, Being a lanky, myopic teenager who was more than happy not to have to work for a living, I just went home and told my parents what happened, and that I guessed I could stay home and play video games tomorrow. Cue my dad driving me down there with a copy of our country's employment laws and giving the guy a piece of his mind. My boss repeatedly reassured him in placating tones that I was indeed, quote, a good boy, and that I could come back to work tomorrow. 
So, despite what Reddit would have you believe, these things can resolve entirely positively sometimes when you, or your dad in my case, stand up for yourself. When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell to turn on notifications. Put the playlist on in the background to finish listening to all the stories. Or if you want to check out some great music, check out easymode.com. If you like Am I the Jerk, give Am I the Genius a shot. Everything linked in the description.